Check, check, check. All right, hello everybody. How's everyone doing? I said, how's everybody doing? <laughs> woo woo! Welcome to the fifth annual Angel Investment Summit. It is so good to see all of your beautiful faces and everybody up there in the viewing area. Can I hear you? All right, so this is good. Okay, well, it's so good that all of you are here today. My name is Alicia, and I am your MC for tonight. Um, I am also uh, a, a part of the innovation community. I lead a company called Rainstick. I'm very familiar with investment, with the raise process. I know how much work it is. We've raised over four million, and I can say every single time you go through a raise, the amount of work and the amount of preparation that you have to go through. And so let's give a huge round for these final six, as well as the rest that have gone through this program. <laughs> so I first would like to uh, acknowledge that we're gathered here today on the unceded territories of the Seals Okanagan people. I feel so lucky to be able to live, work, and play in this incredible valley. We have an action-packed agenda for you tonight. We'll show the agenda here so you can see it. There's a lot going on. All right, so we're gonna get through it. Tonight, you're gonna have the opportunity to get to know each other. I'm sure if you already have a nice drink, so you had a little bit of that, there's definitely gonna be more of that tonight. You're gonna hear the top six pitches. You're gonna have the opportunity also to hear from some folks that have already gone through the investment journey, have now exited either through a merger or an acquisition. I'm super pumped um, about that panel that's gonna be happening a little bit later. And then finally, you're gonna figure out what company leaves here with an investment of $225,000. Woo, woo, woo! So I'd also like to welcome Buffy Mills, a member of the Okanagan Indian Band. Buffy is an Accelerate Okanagan board member and an angel investor in the, the, the summit. Buffy will officially kick off the Okanagan Angel Finale event. Thank you. Why has <laughs> Kahalt in Chesquis, Buffy Mills, in Pius Naxil, in Teal in Kamapalax, Why Lim Lim? Hi everyone, my name is Buffy Mills. I am Seal. I come from a place known as where the people gather, which is located on the north end of Okanagan Lake. Very happy to be here tonight. On behalf of Accelerate Okanagan and Board of Directors, I respectfully acknowledge and the grateful or how grateful we are to be able to work, play, and live on this beautiful ancestral and unceded territory of the Okanagan people, my people, who have been caring for these lands since time memorial. While we re recognize this privilege in being here, it's also important to recognize and highlight the work that is needed to put action to that acknowledgement. To connect with each other, to celebrate our, our, to celebrate our connections and our responsibilities to each other. In my language, we don't have a word for welcome. Um, 
we have a phrase, a very, the closest translation to welcome is, is a phrase in our language that says, we are so happy you have arrived. To put that into context, our people traveled and gathered actually in the place that I'm from. It's called in Kamapalux, the people where the people gather. They used to travel uh, great distances uh, in dangerous conditions. And when they would arrive, we were very, very happy to see them. So we acknowledged them that way with this happy, enthusiastic acknowledgement. I know that the danger has been removed for the, investor, for, for the investors as well as our entrepreneurs. And I understand that for entrepreneurs that this journey that you have been on is, while exciting, also exhausting. But you're here. You've made it. Congratulations. And we are so happy you have arrived. Who limped apanat putnat skal halt. Thank you. Lim Lim. Thank you. Thank you, Buffy. That was a beautiful way to open up the event. Next, I'd like to invite Twee Tran, Director of Programs at Accelerate Okanagan, to say a few words. Thank you, Alicia. Good evening, everyone. After two years of hosting the Angel Summit finale virtually, we are back in person. How good does it feel? <laughs> Woo! And I know we heard from the viewing lounge upstairs maybe one more time. <laughs> and I know the investors, the uh, Okanagan Angel and Summit investors are watching as well. Can we hear from you? Oh, you can do better than that. They're probably drinking it. Right. <laughs> uh, well, first off, on behalf of Accelerate Okanagan, I want to also congratulate the top six as well, and uh, good luck to you tonight. Uh, so for those of you who are new to our tech community, Accelerate Okanagan, we support entrepreneurs build and grow their technology-driven businesses through mentorship, connections, and community. We supported startup founders for over 10 years now, and through unique programming for different stages of growth, in the last five years, we supported over 350 entrepreneurs. Those companies have generated close to $150 million in revenue, attracted $41 million in investment, and have created nearly 600 jobs here in our region. You will hear from some of the founders of those companies later on today during the panel discussions. So this is our fifth year of the Okanagan Angel Summit, and when we piloted the summit, we knew that accessing capital is one of the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs. In order to help them access growth capital, we knew we need to focus on building the local capital community as well. So we started the summit to help bridge the gap in our ecosystem and created more connections between companies looking for investable investors and as well as investors looking for investable companies. The summit has had significant impact since its inauguration in 2019. It supported over 200 companies and 98 investors who have directly invested $805,000 through the summit. We've also been tracking all the participants in the summit, and since 2019, summit alumni have raised more than $22.6 million in investment, a very impressive number. In the past 10 weeks, the 43 investors and the 48 entrepreneurs learned about the investment process through training and structured meetings. And over the last three weeks, the top six finalists have gone through a pretty intense due diligence process and investment readiness training. And tonight, they will be taking the stage one last time to pitch for the $225,000 investment. We can't wait to see who the Summit Angels will choose tonight. But the summit is not just about the one winner. It's about building the investment community within the Okanagan to ensure that companies based here don't have to go far to get funding they need. And for companies from outside the region, they can look to Okanagan Tech to help them succeed. 
Before I pass it back to Alicia, I wanted to say thank you to everyone who made this summit possible. First off, I want to express a huge thank you to our government funder and to all of our sponsors. We couldn't do this program without you. So thank you, NRC IRAP, Lawson Lundell, MNP, BDC, RBCX, Maven Capital Partners, Valhalla Private Capital, Stand Up Ventures, the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission, City of Kelowna, Tourism Kelowna, Kelowna Innovation Center, Red Barn Winery, and Franco's Liquor Store. You all rock. Thank you so much for investing in this program. Last but not least, to our team at Accelerate Okanagan. The summit to, and tonight's finale would not be possible without your vision, your passion, and your hard work. One team, one dream, right? So thank you everyone for coming tonight, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Now I'll pass it back to Alicia. Thank you. All right, so we are almost at the pitches, but there's a few things that we need to talk about before we get there. So let's talk about housekeeping. So for anyone that maybe has not used the bathroom yet and wants to know where it is, uh, you wanna walk right out of here, turn right, men's, women's, it's all there, okay? If you are upstairs in the viewing party area, again, there's also bathrooms on the second floor, so you are taken care of, okay? There's two ticket types. There is a VIP ticket. Everyone in here has it, I hope. <laughs> if you do not have a VIP ticket, you are supposed to be upstairs or outside, but we don't, we're, we're okay, <laughs> you can stay. Uh, our bars are remaining, so feel free, get yourself a drink, go outside, grab another drink responsibly. They are open. You can get more uh, drink tickets. You can purchase them right outside uh, in the bar atrium area. We'll see all six finalists present, and then we're going to head into a 15-minute break before coming back here to watch the panel discussion. So that's kind of logistically what we got going on. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce each panelist, and then I'm also going to introduce their due diligence team lead at the same time, okay? Uh, so following each, each uh, founder's pitch, then the due diligence team lead is going to come up and talk a little bit about the investment process. So a little bit about the due diligence process, okay? So each company had a due diligence team that was made up of four to five investors. So with the due diligence team lead, you're also going to see some really nice photos of the investors that were part of the due diligence process. And these founders have really gone through a lot to get to where they are. They've had multiple meetings for the last 10 weeks plus with their due diligence team, answering really hard questions, getting to the bottom of a lot of the, the, the company information. Uh, the due diligence process is about gathering information and facts to help assess opportunities and mitigate risks, as well as help make a decision on who receives the investment. After the pitch, the due diligence team will join the founder on stage and share a few de details. All right? So now you know what is expected. Let us jump right into it. All right. So. We have randomly selected the order of pitches, and first up, I would like to introduce all of you to Brad Palman from Smart One Technologies. <laughs> Give a huge round of applause, followed by their due diligence team lead, Tim Miller, that will be joined up, coming up on stage after. Hi, everyone. My name is Brad Palman, president and founder of Smart One Technologies. Six years ago, uh, we started building uh, touchscreen vending machines because we wanted to be able to help kids uh, get into science and technology by having a way to vend kits that they would purchase and then provide on-screen technologies that would guide them through the examples of using that. And we really did a great job on inventing a piece of hardware that interfaced with the vending machine. And then about uh, three years ago, I was uh, at one of the Okanagan summits and made it a, a fair ways along, but got a really bunch of great feedback. 
And what's been just an amazing part of this journey is that, you know, three years later after COVID, we're stronger than ever and we've taken that feedback to heart and now we, we're moving ahead in really big ways. The touchscreen vending machine or a pod personalized on demand is really a retrofit product that allows us to tap into a lot of new markets. It's not just chips and chocolate bars being dispensed through these machines. In fact, none of my customers dispense chips and chocolate bars. They, they dispense a lot of other amazing things. So first off, we don't sell snack machines. We support healthcare with dispensing and data. And what that means is we're putting these machines on the doorsteps, in the pharmacies, the hospital vestibules, access to be able to reach healthcare supplies that are needed 24 hours a day for things like the opioid op epidemic, uh, being able to protect yourself from fentanyl, naloxone kits, things like that. We don't build the hardware. In fact, we're an upgrade to the existing 50-year industry that's been using the same types of machines. So what we do is we are a sub software as a subscription technology that allows the vending machines to do a lot more than they could in the past. They can collect data, they can uh, have business rules, all sorts of great things that add extra value and open it up to new opportunities. We don't ship or fill the machines. That's our customers. We have up meals in Vancouver and they have them in YVR and SFU and UBC and BC Ferries. And ultimately it allows them to be able to distribute their catered meals and solutions easier because they shifted pre-pandemic. We're able to be a category hub. So healthcare is one of our other big spokes that we've really endeavored to change the way vending technology works. We also don't pay for clicks. Every single client we've run, we basically built a case study out of them and now that's driving the traffic backwards to us in basically an internal flywheel. So every time we build a machine, we're able to then uh, go ahead and continue that exploration into new things. We have 32 units across Canada and the US right now. And we've got 150 units already in closing that are gonna be distributed in the next 12 months. We're quoting on 1,500 units across North America. And with 200 inbound leads, I need a, uh, a business development team and a sales and marketing team to back up my efforts. I'm great at getting in front of the people. I wanna be able to now close those and have a really tight team. We focused a lot on the product in the last six years and now our team is ready to be able to grow. The machines themselves have a great lifetime value for these customers, about five grand a year recurring and simple setup fees that allow us to quickly scale up. We're looking at landing and expanding in healthcare as the opioid epidemic funds, $80 billion are coming from the US and Canadian government, as well as in HIV and AIDS. These are two really massive areas that need our distribution of self-care and, and kits, automatic testing. So we think these are going to be the ideal locations and those are the 1500 conversations we're having. By year three, I anticipate we can do 10 million a year in ARR. Ultimately, that's a thousand machines and we're at 30, so we're growing very quickly and we're gonna have a strong percentage by the end of this year. We're gonna be using the funds to scale up our marketing team. We've already got the backing of Intel to do this, so we're gonna be able to get some additional funds from them. My business development team, that is a really strategic place, so we're looking for introductions as well as new markets to entertain. One really great thing is we're an R&D side of uh, uh, the industry as well, so we're innovating constantly, and we've been able to secure our next IRAP for 14 months worth of development, which is just going to change the scale at which we can roll this out. As well, because we're R&D, the shred is really there, so with our half million dollars, we basically are doubling down on this year and we're expecting everybody that comes along with us is really gonna see an escalation in this. We have gas in the tank, but we need a lot more to be able to just really rocket ship this as we enter the US market. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. So I'm, uh, my name's Tim Miller. I'm the D, was the DD lead for the Smart One team. Um, normally, the, as the investors, uh, we get to pick the team we're going to be on, but I think I missed that meeting. So I was voluntold to, to come to Smart One. Didn't know anything about it. But I'm pretty grateful I did. I had a really good experience with our team, and as it turned out, we had a nice cross-section of investors with experience in 
uh, legal, finance, sales, and marketing, and it made for an interesting opportunity to deep dive into what the heck Smart One is all about. And it's on the surface, it's sort of about vending machines, but it's really about the technology that's under, underneath. Um, in going through the due diligence process, a couple of things we really want to look at. We're looking at the, the, the capability of our entrepreneur and our founder. And Brad, Brad, you know, how do you say this? Is you got to uh, looks can be deceiving. He's a he's a big intimidating guy, but it turns out, not only is he a pretty damn good technical leader uh, founder, but he's a damn good leader. Um, we spend a lot of time talking to him and his team, and um, they love this guy. Uh, they, they describe him as a man who leads with his heart, and they are as committed to his idea and his vision as he is. And it was, it was really pleasant to see that. Um, through the course of our inquiries, we, we, we learned that uh, Brad has just demonstrated great energy and openness. He, he was open to any questions we could concoct. He was patient with us as we were asking questions. Had a full data room for a company at his stage. It was pretty impressive. Um, He's, he also want to, want to say he demonstrated his entrepreneurial instincts. You know, I, you know, there's something unique about you crazy buggers, eh? Like you're, you're out there creating something from nothing. It's fascinating. Most of us are jealous as hell of you at one time and wonder why the hell you do it. But anyway, um, Brad it just ha so happens he's on a bus ride at some trade show, has a conversation with some dude. Next thing we know, Smart One Health, this thing called Smart One Health is born. Like, talk about seizing an opportunity. That's, that's something unique to entrepreneurs, that they just see things that, what's the idea? They, they don't see the possible. They see the impossible and cause it to come true. And I think that's a great opportunity. And it led to a partnership with a company called Nucleus Labs, a very well-established company in the, uh, um, in the uh, led us to Smart One, uh, Nucleus Labs, a well-established uh, business in the market segment Brad's after, which has since turned into a partnership. Um, I think Brad would describe this as a father-son type relationship with the founder who is 30 plus years experience in this space. Just a, a great partnership putting Smart One and Smart One Health in a quite a unique space to, to, to you know, the, the alignment of stars to, to capture this opportunity. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, we don't really know anything, most of us as investors, we don't really know anything at all about your businesses. We, we know something about the businesses we came from, but nothing at all about yours. Fortunately for Brad, he had, uh, as part of one of his IRAP programs, had to engage uh, an independent consultant to sort of give him a feasibility study to invest in, the, in uh, ex explore what, what's the true market opportunity for this. And I'll just pull a few highlights from that report. Suggesting that this market that Brad's after is a $31 billion in, uh, market in North America alone. They would say that in, in the report suggests that uh, there's visibility and traction for Brad for $352 million in this market space. This is a, this is a big horse for this jockey to ride. Um, and the conclusion of this independent report was that Smart One is a strong potential as a leading disruptor in the sector. I mean, you know, uh, vending machines are not new, but vending machines in these higher value restricted products certainly is. And Smart One, as it turns out, you know, don't judge a book by its cover, is an innovator and leader in this space. So how have things gone so far for Brad? Well, he said, well, he's on a million dollars equity raise and another million dollars in non-dilutive grants and funds. This is what he's created. As he said, Smart One's got 32 uh, units in the marketplace in line of sight to another 150, a $27.5 million uh, lifetime value attached to one of those machines. With uh, that's a, There's a significant business operation in there. The business today is profitable. Uh, and expects to be so. So I think you'd say, we'd, from our team's point of view, he's doing pretty bloody well. He's doing pretty bloody well. There's, an early, there's, a, there's a stage in investing, I'll say this. It's to bet on the jockey, not the horse. So we look at the quality of the leader and the quality of the team that they built, and go, well, we don't know if your idea is any damn good, but we have a lot of confidence that you will take whatever it is you've got going, and you will turn it into something good. And I, uh, with, with, with full honesty, I can say, in uh, Smart One, you got both. There's a hell of a horse for this jockey to ride, and it needs to be a big one, because look at the size of that guy. Um, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Brad, for, for showing up at the competition.
right, thank you very much, Brad. I have definitely seen Smart One Technologies at YVR. Super cool, very excited for, for your growth story. Uh, and thank you very much, Tim, for, for going through the, the DD process. So up next, I would like to welcome Viri Perez from Nano Sentinel Technologies, followed by their due diligence lead, Alex Greer. Welcome. I just wanted to take it in. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Viri Perez. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Nano Sentinel. And we build the best lab in a box for finding toxic trace metals in really any sample where we started with water. We're trying to help fuel cell manufacturers with process optimization, saving time and money. You might not be too familiar with metals, but in, in energy storage, they are essential. They can be really good optimizing energy storage, or they can be really bad. Sony learned this the, the hard way in 2006, when they lost 65% of their annual profit recalling batteries that were contaminated with only a few specks of dust of metal. But how can you really blame them? It, testing for metals is super difficult. You either buy your own instrument, try to find the right talent for it, or spend just as much uh, contracting the services from laboratories and having to wait up to two weeks or even more sometimes to get results. When you're managing a production line, you don't really want to wait two weeks. The fuels and manufacturers are facing now the same problem. On one end, they're trying to maximize the energy output on the fuel cells by putting metals in there. But on the other end, they need to keep this technology clean. We don't want the traces of uh, metals in the exhaust of fuel cells to be the new um, emissions that we'll worry about tomorrow. And this is where we came up with the solution. We have a combination of hardware and software. It's really, really easy to use. You only need a droplet of the sample to measure. You get results in four minutes, not two weeks. And it's 90% less waste than you would normally produce with traditional technology. We're a B2B platform as a service company. We have a combination of a rental hardware, software, with that host or proprietary database. And there's an additional consumable sales. We recovered the cost of the device in only three months, and we have pretty good margins for our subscription model. This is a picture of our first customer. This is a Fortune 200 company, very well known for their diesel manufacturing, um, now venturing into clean energy, and we're already helping them. We have an LO, a signed LOI. We're waiting for the annual subscription contract to be signed. We're really excited to help them make a cost and time saving. We have three different types of subscription models uh, to accommodate all levels of enterprise. The basic is better suited for small startups and small companies. Most companies are going to be in the plus model, and the enterprise is really helpful for the service providers. Um, part of the revenue comes from the subscription, but there's a variable recurrent revenue from the consumables. Of course, there are big companies create, uh, selling these large instruments. They sell directly to, ser uh, to service providers, but none of them are fast, um, low waste, or portable. And that is something we can do with our technology. The opportunity in Canada is 300 million. That is a bottom-up calculation. Uh, the next big market we will tackle is the North American market, so US and the rest of Latin America. And of course, there's a huge need in Europe, especially with the current pressing needs in energy due to geopolitical issues. Our go-to-market strategy is selling directly, first with the fuel cell manufacturers. Some of them will become service providers as well. But we also see a huge opportunity in the mining um, and exploration segment. Uh, so it's a, currently an underserved market, and they're the ones that wait the longest, sometimes even waiting nine months to get results back. And of course, as we expand in, uh, our outreach uh, to other geographies, we will have to find channel partners. And as you notice, some of these are also uh, manufacturers of instrumentation, and they're also potential acquirers for us. 
We started in 2019 with just an idea and a proof of concept. Last year, we finished our product. We are filing a patent next week. We're, we're following that up with uh, trademark registration, and we're now ramping up on uh, scaling our sales. It's been an adventure, <laughs> and none of that has, would have been possible without an amazing team. On one end, we have Derek, who's a super agile uh, web builder. We have Goose, who's amazing at building sensors and hardware and software integration. And I've been leading on the chemistry side and the business development. And we're extremely lucky to be super supported by our local ecosystem. We have everything in our uh, advisory board, um, everything from investment, high technical expertise, day-to-day -day operations, and also technology scale-up. We're raising $800,000 to capture 11 accounts by year end and increase our capacity to test for metals. And if you have any connections in the fuel cell or the mining industry, please come talk to me after. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Alex Greer. I'm the um, due diligence lead for Nano Sentinel. So first off, I'd like to thank the other members of the due diligence team. So Nicole Rustat, Derek Lonsborough, Andrew Gaucher, and Claudio Rojas, with some assistance from um, Carolyn Schaefer and Sheldon Gardner. So we'd also like to thank Dr. Barry Perez uh, and her entire founding team for the time and effort it takes to go through the due diligence process. This is really the first time uh, the potential investors and the founders get a chance to actually have a working relationship together. And it gives us an insight into how these uh, founders have been running their business, how they think, how they operate. And fortunately for us, it was pretty obvious quite early on that Dr. Perez runs a very tight ship, runs an extremely lean organization, and is very well organized, which made our lives a lot easier. <laughs> So whenever we needed documents, she had them. And whenever we had questions and clarifications, she always had clear and forthright and honest answers. So that just built up a lot of trust between the investors and the founders. So in a startup that's based heavily on tech, we want to make sure that the founding team has uh, a really fundamental understanding of the technology and the software and hardware to turn it into a product. And this uh, founding team certainly has that all covered. In addition, they've got a great advisory board that has the business experience as well as scale up and investment experience. So that's really nice to see. We know that they're gonna be well, uh, well mentored. The one deficit that they have right now is simply a lack of a, a full-time salesperson and that's their next step. Um, so now that they have a product that is market ready, they're, sending, they're gonna send a salesperson out to beat down the doors and bring the sales in. So the market for this technology is expanding rapidly. You don't need to be part of the industry to know that batteries, fuel cells, and hydrogen production are part of a rapidly expanding market in this part of the world and around the world. And if you include uh, possible adjacent markets like mining and water quality testing, the underlying technology here has enormous potential. So Nano Sentinel has spent the past few years uh, working through the underlying science doing the product development, as well as the all important in this space, uh, protection of intellectual property. So as Dr. Perez mentioned, the patent's going in, so that certainly makes investors feel comfortable that they won't just get copied. Um, now that they've sorted out the product, they also have an, uh, a letter of intent in hand from a multinational that is investing enormous amounts of money into the zero emission technology space. Uh, on top of that, on top of that revenue, their positioning within the clean tech space opens them up to fantastic opportunities for non-dilutive funding from government and other sources. And governments are actively pushing and supporting uh, anyone who's driving towards our carbon-free future. When investing in private startups, you always want to keep an eye on um, how you are possibly going to exit or sell your shares down the road. And so some companies take the route of an IPO and become listed on a public stock exchange. 
What's more likely in this sort of situation is uh, looking around at the, the other companies in the instrumentation and lab services industries, those companies would see this as an ideal uh, strategic acquisition. So all in all, Nano Sentinel is an early stage company with a great founding team, a novel product, in a growing market. So those are exactly the characteristics that uh, angel investors are looking for. So good luck to Dr. Perez, good luck to all the other companies, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Perez. Thank you very much uh, to the due diligence team. And I will say it is so important, especially working in the clean tech space, to focus on solutions that are low waste. So that won't create more problems at scale. So really appreciate that solution. So thank you very much again. And I would now like to welcome Jason Elliott and Marty First from Perfectly Snug followed by their due diligence league lead, Hugh Falloon. And I know Perfectly Snug has something that's great for all of us that struggle with sleep. So you'll be excited to hear from them. Well, hello, it's great to be here. My name's Jason Elliott. My name is Marty Furs, and we are looking for $2.5 million of investment to rapidly grow our company perfectly snug. How many of you want to sleep better? <laughs> yeah, like that guy. I was a terrible sleeper. I was like that guy. I was always too hot, and I was tossing and turning, and the, it was killing me. I, my health was terrible. I tried everything, new mattresses, bedding, fans, nothing worked. And you know, I'm not alone. Many people struggle with sleeping too hot, and they toss and turn, and they have night sweats, and they disagree with their spouse about the temperature of their room. If you're a hot sleeper, you know that a cooling solution is not a mere convenience, it's a necessity. The, the, the smart topper is a two inch layer that sits on top of your mattress under the fitted sheet. Embedded fans propel air under you and against your body. The amount of cooling and heating adjusts automatically based on sensors that are built into the topper to keep you at the perfect temperature all night long. Our sleep technology reduces tossing and turning. It eliminates night sweats. Menopausal women can say goodbye to hot flashes. And couples, they each get their own temperature that they prefer. Our patented technology has active airflow for cooling, dual zones so couples can each have their own temperature, and it has intelligence sensing that measures your body temperature. You can control the topper using buttons on either side of the topper or using our phone app. Our customer satisfaction is very high. They describe the, the product as life-changing, a marvel, nothing short of miraculous. You know, I myself no longer struggle to sleep. Instead of tossing and turning, I get sleep all the way through the night now. Our product really works. We sold over half a million last year, which is five times more than the previous year. Every mattress company describes their mattresses as cool or cooling, but they don't actually cool. These mattress companies are addressing a market demand for bed cooling, but they don't have a real solution. Our primary competitors shown here have bulky floor-mounted systems that pump water through plastic pads on top of the bed. They're susceptible to water leaks, condensation, and mold. But the perfectly smug, smug smart topper has no possibility of leaks. It has no bulky units on the floor, no pipes or hoses going to the bed. And furthermore, it exhausts excess humidity from the sleep environment to keep the sleeper cool and comfortably dry all night. We expect our annual revenue to exceed 100 million by 2028. And we're working hard to grow this company uh, and seeking an exit with an acquisition to a mattress brand for a greater than 10 times return for our investors. I have funded two high technology product based companies in the past with successful exits of 10x and 19x return. I have the end to end experience to make this venture a winner. And I've developed many products and led large manufacturing and engineering teams at Kodak and as a VP of R&D at Schneider Electric. 
I'm also a skilled thermodynamics engineer uniquely suited to develop our product. Uh, we are seeking an equity investment of 2.5 million in preferred shares, and we have 300,000 soft circles so far. Jason and I have invested $1.45 million of our own money, and we have identified a real uh, need, a real problem with a real, a real need that is experienced by a majority of the population. We've developed an effective and elegant solution We've demonstrated product market fit, and we have a proven team. Now it is time to invest and accelerate growth. We know how to build and successfully exit a business. Marty's done it twice before. Every aspect of this company is already operating. The customers love the product, and the market is huge. This will go big. If you are interested in investing, please don't leave here tonight without talking to us. Thank you for your time and your consideration. And after the event tonight, we'll be showing the Smart Topper upstairs on the third floor in Tonnet's office. Thank you, Jason. Uh, it's the office near the elevator on the third floor. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Hugh Falloon, and I am the co-lead with the due diligence team for Preferably Snug. I want to thank the other members of the team, my co-lead Sherry, as well as Michelle, Scott, Grant, and Doug for their contributions leading to this interesting discussions over this last four weeks. It's been a real pleasure working with uh, the Marty and uh, Jason. They have been fantastic uh, to deal with throughout the due diligence process well-organized, responsive, open to information about their company and the product. They're very open to our feedback, sometimes tough, and regularly checked in to see how we were doing. The due diligence process includes completing an extensive checklist. Items such as corporate legal information, capital structures, cap tables, financial history, projections, management, personnel, marketing, business, and more. There's a ton of information for the founders to supply and for us to go through, as you can imagine. Jason and Marty made the process easy by having this all in their data room, well organized in the start of week one. So let's get into some of our findings. Marty and Jason founded Perfectly Stug in November 2018. Marty, as he said, is an engineer, seasoned business executive, entrepreneur of two successful startups and exits under his belt, he co-founded companies developing high-performance digital cameras with machine vision, ca vision cameras before starting uh, Perfectly Snug. Jason's background is in thermal engineering. He has extensive experience in complex product development, manufacturing, leading large teams in fuel cell, high provision optical solar, the solar industry. Good for solving heat problems, I guess. We heard Jason's personal experience dealing with the poor sleep, quality as a hot sleeper, that led to the development of this product. Jason tried many cooling mattress and topper products in the market, but nothing was effective. These two engineers and their team used their expertise to create the smart topper with an innovative approach and unique features that provide superior performance and results compared to what is not currently on the market. The smart topper gained CSA and UL regulatory approval in November 2020. It received its US patent July 2022. The combination of the patent and proprietary software helps protect their product from direct imitation. This technology is being used to develop their cooling mattress, which is they see as an important step in propelling their growth market acceptance. This is really going to accelerate their business. Perfectly Snug is addressing a big problem of the majority of the population, as you heard. The poor quality sleep because, because people overheat. The lack of quality sleep can lead to significant health problems, as well as productivity and mood swings. Perfectly Snug sees an obtainable market for their product in Canada and US of around $1.6 billion. They sold 335 units in their fiscal 
2022 year end, generating 460K of revenue just through their website. Customer reviews we have seen say it's magical, game changing, and the best one I like. Only time in 60 years I've been able to sleep throughout the night. Marty and uh, Jason and Marty developed com a comprehensive uh, marketing strategy to promote both the Smart Topper and the Smart Mattress. You heard that personally, they have both invested a significant, significant amount, as we call it, skin in the game. They personally committed 1.3 million through originally shareholder loans, which has recently changed to equity. They've secured an additional 850,000 in equity investments from family and friends. And now they are currently trying to raise 2.5 million to focus on sales and marketing to finalize the mattress production, sales and marketing, and increase production capacity. Now angel investing is high risk with hopefully higher financial rewards. So if you're gonna get involved, you gotta take a lot of time to do your own due diligence. In my opinion, it comes down to are the founders committed to achieving their long-term goals with their money and our money? Gary and I believe uh, Marty and Jason are, so we are gonna continue communications to make a personal investment after in the, in the coming weeks. In closing, I just want to add, earlier this week, health.com in the United States included the Smart Topper as one of their top 10 sleep products during the 2023 March Sleep Awareness Week. Congratulations. Thanks very much, Jason, Marty, and Hugh. I can say I am sold. I think my husband can attest I'm the perfect candidate as both a hot, restless sleeper, someone who uh, is a founder and has many sleepless nights. I'm excited to go check it out at the end of tonight. Yes, that's great. So up next, we have Brianne Miller from NADA, followed by their due diligence team, Chris Wormald. Unfortunately, Brianna was not able, Brianne was not able to join us in person, but she has sent us a video of her pitch, so we will play that for you right now. Thank you. We have a big plastics problem, and our food system is responsible for a full quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions. Grocery shopping sucks, and grocery stores themselves are the epitome of these two problems. My name is Brianne Miller, and I'm the founder and CEO of NADA. We're solving these by refilling and delivering responsibly sourced, package-free groceries to grocery shoppers like you and to customers who want to reduce their food and packaging waste. In-store, you can bring in your own containers to refill using our smart tag weighing system to buy only what you need. And online, you can browse close to 1,000 responsibly sourced foods, choose delivery or pickup, track your containers and credits, and use our reorder feature to make next week's grocery shop super quick and easy. We use what's called reverse logistics to sell responsibly sourced foods in reusable containers. We've developed the underlying tech ecosystem to buy and sell groceries using reusable containers. Think of NADA as like your modern milkman for every item in your fridge and, in your fridge and pantry. This technology ultimately allows us to scale quickly and includes a custom e-commerce platform, container and deposit tracking, and selling food by weight. This means that our customers get a seamless, fun, and easy experience both online and in-store. We're the first ones in the country to do this and have spent years figuring out the systems to make it scale. Our customers are super smart, they're savvy, they're environmentally conscious, and they're the same ones that turn Whole Foods from a small hippie market to the leading grocer of natural and organic foods. They have disposable income, they're willing to pay a premium, and they're a quickly growing demographic as millennials and Jed Zeds use their money to vote with their dollars. At NADA, we're redesigning the grocery industry to make circular food systems the future of food. We're 12 months to profitability, capturing less than 1% of the Vancouver market, and we have a realistic path to 10x that. If you believe that climate change is going to continue to drive customers to vote with their wallets, this market only continues to take off. Just like Patagonia and Whole Foods, we plan to scale with a website, warehouse, and small retail footprint in key urban areas. People are already coming to us from Vancouver Island and Whistler and Coquitlam to shop. 
And since the beginning of last year, we've expanded our services to 10 new cities, we've secured a new warehousing space, and we've acquired a competitor to leverage our buying power. We have three diverse revenue streams that include distribution to other grocery stores, online, and retail. Our retail operations broke even within our first year with a million, uh, 1.4 million in sales. And a model like this is really going to turn this industry upside down. We're not super sure when that's gonna happen, but we're really well positioned to continue leading this space. So here's where we're at. We are currently serving more than 1,500 active loyal customers with a 73% returning customer rate. 25% of our customers have placed orders totaling more than $1,000 and our top customers have spent more than 10,000. This is also with a current customer acquisition cost of only $15. We have a higher revenue per square foot than Whole Foods and Loblaws and our B2B orders are $825 per cart with a 100% reorder rate. Our gross margins are also impressive at a small scale. Ours is currently 42.5% and poised to grow with the addition of new product categories. And this is compared to an industry average of roughly 33%. We also have less than 1% shrink due to food recovery. We really have created this business model that keeps people coming back. You just can't unsee the plastic in a normal grocery shop once you've shopped with Nada. Our team is incredibly passionate about the power of food as a climate solution, and we're backed by experts in e-commerce, retail, and grocery, including the founders and executives of brands that we really know and love, including Arcteryx, Shopify, Spud, Tentry, and Whole Foods. We're raising a $2 million round to get us to profitability with 1.8 million already closed. This is a really quickly growing category with lots of activity in this space right now, including Peter Pot in Europe and the rounds in the Eastern United States both who have raised between 10 and $40 million in their series, series A rounds. The key highlights for this investment include a quick path to profitability and an incredibly loyal customer base who are really looking for what we have, giving us great gross margins at a small scale. The exit path is also clear through strategic acquisition by large grocery and as federal single use plastic ban policies are starting to catch up to this consumer demand, we're really well positioned to lead these initiatives. The icing on the cake is that we really do have impact baked into our business model. We have proven traction and numbers to show that people, planet, and profit work incredibly well together. We're a certified B Corporation, carbon negative, we pay living wages, we recover surplus food, and we've diverted more than a million and a half containers from landfill. We would really love the Okanagan Angel Summit to oversubscribe this round and to join the six funds already on our cap table. With our proven traction and a resilient business model that truly supports people, planet, and profit, we know this can be a big win for everyone at the table. Thank you. Hi, I'm Chris, and this is a report from the NADA diligence team, Monica, Graham, Henry, Kayla, and myself. It's been a great experience getting to know Brienne and her team, including a physical visit to their store and warehouse in Vancouver. Resilience. If there's one word to sum up what we've learned about Brienne and NADA to date, it's resilience. Many companies have a great plan. The deck and strategy looks awesome, but then reality strikes. There's a lot of mess that happens when great plans intersect with market realities. Nada looks messy because it is a real business today. They've navigated and survived going to market, building a client base, living through pandemic force shutdowns, and the loss of key personnel. Through it all, the company, through it all, the company continues, and Brienne's resilience has impressed us. Venture capitalists have a list of founder traits that we look for. That list includes people who are product builders, who are fearless, and who are resilient. Brienne has recognized a need with a segment of consumers who want to purchase food differently and has built an experience for that tribe with an amazing moat and unit economics. She's a product builder. She oozes fearlessness and resilience. Smart early stage investors bet on the jockey over the horse since founder passion and capability is most closely aligned with successful outcomes. Brienne is a founder who knows how to build a product, demonstrates fearlessness, and most of all, resilience. We don't worry about replacing the CEO, which means less risk and increased stability. Uh, it's in, it is unfortunate Brienne can't be here today for you to meet her. She made the decision to remain with a close family member in a time of medical need, showing more about her character. 
But looking at the market in NADA, we live in a heavily branded world that creates an incredible amount of waste. Just as the health facts around tobacco led to profound changes in the way that cigarettes are envisioned, sold, and consumed, there's many aspects of our daily life that will change as environmental initiatives continue to gain steam. It was not long ago that people who cared for the environment got branded as activists. Today I get scolded by my neighbors for not putting out the composting. NADA enables a growing segment of consumers to buy food in a way that aligns with their values. NADA's employment of a circular economy has captured 1,500 of the 1.1 million households in the Vancouver area. That's tiny. With demographics and consumer sentiment as tailwinds, there's an opportunity to double, double again, and double again in the coming years. And that's just in Vancouver. Brianna's outlined NADA's impressive unit economics already. Their business generates 42% gross margins in an industry that only gets 32% at scale. We believe that NADA can get to over 50% gross margins in the next couple of years as growth gives them buying power. People are paying more for NADA to NADA for environmentally conscious consumption. Part of NADA's strategy is to pay their employees a living wage, minimizing staff turnover, and enabling better store operating economics with retained know-how. As zero waste stores pop up in many cities, they focus on home and body care items, representing a small fraction of the problem and the easiest part to solve. Very few dare take on the beast of traditional grocery waste. NADA goes where others won't, making logistically impossible, making the logistically impossible possible. They figured out how to turn old produce into soups and other things, leaving them with less than 1% waste and a revenue per square foot metric that eclipses anything else in the grocery industry by miles. Again, these metrics get better with scale. NADA's strengths and tailwinds. NADA's largest asset is a forever loyal set of customers who want to live carbon negative lives. This cohort will only get larger over time. NADA also has an appealing ESG story for many food brands and products. Many producers are not only okay with selling products without their brand on it, but want to wrap this into an in a significant environmental initiative as part of their brand identity. Bans on single-use packaging will force a reordering on the value chain and go to market for retailers and brands. A policy change would represent a significant boon for NADA. Finally, smart financial investors in other parts of the world have written significant checks with at least three other companies in this space raising over $10 million. We like the validation proving that NADA isn't just an environmental play. Smart investors believe there's a profit opportunity. When Whole Foods appeared, its organic and local focus was dismissed as too niche. Then Amazon acquired it for $13 billion. Today, Whole Foods looks mainstream as most grocery establishments have added an organic and natural section. Could NADA represent the next real innovation in grocery retail? Successful ventures show up early when there's barely a whiff of a market. NADA's environmental roots, stable leadership, loyal customer base, and business practicality gives them an unfair advantage in the next dimension of grocery distribution, going where mainstream stores can't follow. It's an amazing moat. We recommend NADA as both a great investment opportunity and a company we can all feel good about supporting as they look to enable an emerging population segment. Thank you so much, Chris, for representing and speaking to the due diligence process of NADA. I've known NADA's work over the last couple of years. We are both Coralis, formerly CEO Ventures, so we've been very impressed with the impact first approach uh, and their resiliency throughout the pandemic has been phenomenal. So super excited to see that they're here. Up next, I'd like to welcome Jason Latotsky from Tonnet. Uh, followed by his due diligence lead, Jason Bond. How's it going, everyone? Hello? There we go. How's it going, everyone? My name is Jason Latoski, and I'm the CEO and founder of Tunnet, a global community for motorcycle riders. We are partnered with Alex and Mark Marquez, eight-time world champion MotoGP riders with access to over 350 million live viewers in the MotoGP circuit. We're partnered with them for the next two years, and they're set to drive massive growth for our business. Motorcycling is awesome. Tunnet platform is offered to all types of motorcycle riders. Whether you're a sport bike rider, cruiser rider, dirt bike rider, our platform is for you. 
the $207 billion market. There's 213 million motorcycle enthusiasts globally, but there's 1.5 billion people who ride a motorcycle, moped, or scooter. It's an extremely loyal, dedicated, and passionate market, and when these riders like something, they spend a lot of money on it. The average rider spends $4,000 a year on motorcycling, 10 times more than the average person spends on their hobby. What is your hobby? How about cycling or publishing or reading books? If you're a cyclist, you've probably heard of an app called Strava. Strava saw an opportunity to revolutionize the cycling industry by connecting the riders with key industry data along with a powerful and passionate community behind it. Wattpad connected readers and publishers with a strong community to reading and publishing data for their books. Both of these companies are extremely valuable. Strava sold for one, or Strava is valued at $1.7 billion, and Wattpad sold for $700 million two years ago. Hunnit is doing the same that Strava and Wattpad did for their industries, for the motorcycle industry. We are revolutionizing this industry. We have 213,000 downloads. We have 1.9 million monthly at, or engagements. We have 18,000 active users, and we have 7,000 active motorcycle clubs on our platform. We connect the riding community with posts, ride tracking, ride sharing, events, clubs, and much, much more. How do we do this? We start by the riding community where a rider has a profile and they can connect with that community, post on an app and share. Secondly, we add the ride tracking element where you can track and share that riding experience with the community and see analytics and data about your route and ride. Then we connect to the motorcycle and give you specific bike data like G-forces, lean angles, throttle position and much, much, much more that motorcycle riders geek out on. Finally, the route and road information like segments, um, difficulty, and much more, and as well as safety features. Tunnet goes in the center of all that and connects to an extremely passionate community that's highly engaged, connected, that drives a ton of revenue because these riders love our product. We make money through a subscription, advertising, and B2B partnerships. All of these revenue models amount to $45 per new user that joins our platform. Some of the traction. We have an extremely scalable platform which is this built on the same technology that Strava has and they've scaled to over 200 million active users. We have a leading retention engagement that is right now printing at 8% month over month organic user growth as well as we're revenue generating. We have world class partners like Mark and, Mark and Alex Marquez to bring us world class exposure that we just closed. I'm going to Spain in 30 days to do a video shoot and use, use this opportunity for global announcement. Finally, we have a B2B partnership with Cardo, which has 1.2 million customers to drive growth, as well as the final stages of a massive partnership with Honda to connect their, our app with their bike. This will drive hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of revenue a month for our business and bring in millions of customers. We use our network effects of our app, these massive brand awareness with 92 million live viewers of that MotoGP circuit, as well as these massive business partnerships that we're building to drive growth. We expect that we can easily hit 140,000 users active by the end of this year and 340,000 active users with the round that we're raising right now. Any money we raise on top of this round will exponentially add to this fuel or this fire. We expect to do $1.2 million in revenue and break even this year given the ec economy and do $3.4 million in revenue the following year based purely on that organic growth with the boost of these partners. If we can get to 40 million, or when we get to 40 million passion enthusiasts on this platform, we'll be doing $1.8 billion in direct revenue to Tunnet, similar revenues to Strava. Myself, Graham, Falco, and Nick all have the experience in the areas that we need to drive this business to where it needs to go, with growing user bases, managing community, building a technical platform the same as Strava, and myself, a passionate rider to drive growth to our business. We also have a leading team of experts from Red Bull, Formula One, MotoGP, and those brothers that I was speaking about who truly believe in what we're doing. This is going to bring us to the next level. We're looking for 700,000. We'll oversubscribe this round if we, if we win the summit. Thank you so much. Um, yes. <laughs> Woo! There we go.
Hello, my name is Jason Vaughn. I had the pleasure of uh, leading the DD team for Tonnet, and I want to thank my team, Laura, Matt, Dallas, and Shane, for providing their time and their unique expertise. I also want to thank Jason and Falco and Graham, the entire team at Tonnet, for making themselves available and being responsive to all of our requests. Uh, Jason is a consummate entrepreneur. Um, he's a pretty humble guy. He's an, he's an engineer, he's an accountant, designer, and continues to be successful at raising funds for his business. His enthusiasm for Tonnet is infectious. Um, I'm not a motorcycle rider, but I'm pretty excited about it now. Um, his ability to maintain his passion over the last four and a half years shows his true commitment to the space. Um, so after we checked a few of the, the, the regular DD boxes, uh, specifically with this one, compliance, user privacy, and security on the online space, our team focused our due diligence on four areas for Tonnet uh, that we think that they need to be successful. One is the ability to attract users to the platform. Uh, two, retain and engage users with a compelling content and features uh, while being able to scale. Uh, provide a compelling paid user model that provides a sustainable revenue stream. And finally, plan and action to drive other sources of revenue. On the first one, attracting users to Tonnet, the team has a proven track record, track record of attracting new sign-ons and has successfully signed in 230,000 users and 7,000 clubs. Uh, they were originally able to do this at a considerable cost and decided to lean their company and reduce their burn rate significantly. I think what's a compelling stat, and Jason couldn't get into, is right now they're growing 5% month over month with zero spend, which is exciting in the social media space. The product is built to scale on a platform that's industry leading. Um, major social media platforms use the same technology they do and can scale to the size. There's no limit to what he can do with respect to the technology. So the Marquez brothers are the cornerstone of the strategy to drive compelling content. This will start to steepen the growth curve to allow investment in more programmers and uh, community specialists for Jason to have on his team. Again, I'm not a motorcycle rider, but it doesn't take much research to identify the fantastic community that MotoGP has, and the Marquez brothers really lead in this space. I strongly suggest as a master reading the product, product roadmap. It's exciting, and the step-by-step -step process with timeline allows you to understand how he's going to get from A to B. Uh, the next big steps, the language improvements to grow in Europe, um, to meet where the MotoGP is, is, is huge in Europe, is, is around the world, so making sure those languages can be on his app. The gamification of the platform to encourage friendly competition and engage people, improve mapping functionality, built on the same technology that made Strava successful. Uh, Jason knows all the key retention and, and engagement metrics and believes that these are all going to be needle movers for him to get to where he needs to get to. The full throttle paid membership will get a big boost with the exclusive, um, the exclusive access to the Marquez Brothers and giveaways with companies like Ducati. Um, if you go online now and see giveaways, you know that drives tr the kind of traffic that you need to get. Jason and our team talked about also working with community builders across the platform to broaden the offering and build revenue. Finally, Jason only hinted at what is, and he's really only scratched the surface on the advertising and partnerships on the platform. His vision has always been, uh, and it, this, this platform needs to create an authentic community for the motorcycle users before he goes to that really that next stage. The potential for advertising to the enthusiast is huge, and Jason has hinted at the in-depth conversations with motorcycle manufacturers whose current mobile apps just are falling flat. Companies like Honda have a huge gap to fill and are exploring Tonnet significantly. In closing, there's 1.5 billion motorcycles riders in the world and 200 million enthusiasts. I want to wish Tonda all the best at the competition, and I hope he takes a massive bite out of that market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason and Jason. That I'm so proud that we have this type of innovation right out of this building, the Innovation Center. This is where Tonnet is housed, um, and that the Okanagan has these type of businesses. Super exciting. Um, so how's everyone doing? Feeling good? All right, that's good. So we have one last presentation for you uh, before we take a break. So I would like to welcome Stephen Parslow from Salon Monster, followed by their due diligence lead, Karen Olsen. Hi. Perfect. Got my slides. Um, hi, I'm Stephen, CEO at Salon Monster. Our team believes that hairstylists and personal service providers are some of the forgotten entrepreneurs of our society. And our mission is to provide digital tools to help them run successful and profitable businesses. 
I'm sure everyone here remembers the feeling of an embarrassing childhood haircut, or how they felt after they'd had an amazing service at the salon. Hairstylists don't just cut hair, they actually change how we feel about ourselves. Now, when we think of salons, we tend to think of them as a single business with employees. But today, over 50% of salons are chair rental salons. This is where self-employed stylists rent in a shared space. And with over 50 years of experience, our team is uniquely positioned to provide solutions for this new space. Unlike employees, chair renters manage everything to do with their business. They establish their own schedule, collect and keep all their revenue, actively market their services, and maintain their own exclusive client list. Why does this matter? Well, first off, it's good business, but it's also how revenue agencies assess whether they're an employee or self-employed. And the reality is salon software is designed for employee-based salons. This means businesses close due to unexpected payroll and back taxes. And we regularly see stylists lose all their client data when they move salons. And they move a lot throughout their career. For them, their client list is their number one asset. And losing that data can cost them tens of thousands in lost revenue. So what if chair renters had a digital toolkit that gave them exclusive control of their customer data throughout their entire career? Self-contained payment processing to give them immediate access to their funds, and the ability to easily disconnect from one salon and move to a new salon and reconnect with the team located there. And what if chair rental salon owners and these are people who don't want to manage a team of staff. That's why they opened a chair rental salon. If they had management tools to make it really easy to coordinate their chair renters, the ability to protect themselves against being misclassified as an employer, and tools to automatically bill their chair rental every month so they don't have to chase down rent. We're making this a reality with Salon Monster. We're targeting an initial beachhead market of independent stylists and chair renters in North America. This represents over 950,000 practitioners, a serviceable obtainable market of 102 million, a TAM of 855 million. And other service industries face the same challenge. So once we're established, we're gonna broaden our base to other areas like tattoo artists, personal trainers, groomers, and more, for a serviceable obtainable market of 1.2 billion. Now while there's competition in this market, they're focused on employee-based salons, not chair rental. Companies like Figaro, Forest, and Timely focus on employee salons. And some, like StyleSeat, while they provide some independent stylist services, don't provide any means for collaboration between team members. And generic products like Square, while they provide a good toolkit, don't provide any of the specialization required in the industry. Our app is currently in 320 paid salons, and our customer acquisition cost is $235. Our customer lifetime value is $3,500, and we're currently working to double that to $7,000 through payment integration, which we're currently rolling out. Over the next two years, we're looking to 10 times our revenue and reach profitability, with a goal of 15 million ARR by 2027. This isn't our first rodeo. Our team's founded multiple companies. Christine, Ken, and myself, founded Peerstream, a peer-to-peer -peer file hosting company that we took to 2 million ARR before selling. Ken helped me build the tech stack at BetterCard Analytics, a Canadian grocery, -based, grocery analytics company focused on using AI for grocery pricing. And my team built the app for Campertunity, who was a finalist in last year's Okanagan Summit. And we're really excited to announce that we've just signed Trevor Johnson from JNAP, who is one of the world's leaders in terms of paramedical online booking and clinic management as one of our advisors. We've been working really hard and have great traction with over 300 million in salon revenue booked. As you can see from this graph, we've been working hard to get really good product market fit, and we've managed to get our churn rate down to a low 0.8% per month, which gives us a 10 and a half year average customer lifespan. So we're raising 750,000 to scale growth. We're going to use these funds to um, we're going to use these funds to build out our sales and marketing team, fund our advertising budget, and increase our app development. And I should also add in there that we're raising that 750 on a four million valuation. There's a lot of investor interest in this space. At the end of 2022, Mango Mint raised 13 million on 200,000 bookings per month. That's just double what Salon Monster has. We've got a lot of interest for potential acquirers already, and when it's at the right time and we've reached a high ARR, we will, acquire, we will be open to acquisition.
Um, our customers love our app, and uh, we're really passionate about it. Thanks so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Olson. I'm a 25-year veteran of the tech industry and a serial entrepreneur, and I'm thrilled to be a first-time participant in the Okanagan Angel Summit. I had the privilege of being part of the due diligence team for the Salon Monster, for Salon Monster, along with my fellow investors, Corey, Chrissy, Jim, James, and Grace. I'm grateful for their insights and experience, and I've learned a great deal from this team as we've gone through this due diligence process. I can safely say, that we all agree it's been really great to get to know Salon Monster CEO Stephen Parslow over the last couple of months. Stephen is a professionally trained architect, originally from New Zealand, currently living on Vancouver Island with his co-founder and wife, Christine. Stephen has spent most of his career in tech and has a history successfully bootstrapping companies. As a group, we found Stephen to be smart, thoughtful, highly coachable, and a technically savvy founder. Stephen has quickly been able to take and execute on the coaching and business advice we provided to him during the provided to him during the summit. This is the first time Stephen has raised capital for a business, and he's proven that he's committed to making this venture a success for himself and others. Stephen and his team have built a solid, feature-rich business management toolkit for salons and hairstylists that started gaining initial traction with salon owners growing to over 320 paid users on the app in a relatively short period of time, primarily through referrals and word of mouth marketing. In late 2022, early 2023, the Salon Monster team shifted their focus slightly to the chair rental market for self-employed stylists. Previously, they offered services to both chair rental stylists and employee-based salons. Through analysis of their existing paid accounts, they are seeing their most robust traction, where they're seeing the most robust traction is chair rental accounts, and currently constitutes 88% of their existing paid customers. By focusing on the chair rental market, they are prioritizing the market segment with the best performance and the least amount of competition. We believe that this shift in focus will allow them to become leaders in the chair rental software market. Salon Monster's current customer acquisition cost is $235 per customer with a lifetime value of $3,500. And with the anticipated addition of payment processing revenue coming online within the next two months, the LTV is expected to climb to nearly $7,000. In addition to the clarity in their product market fit, the traction in their particular segment, and a robust technology offering, Stephen has been successful in, um, sorry. Stephen, um, and Stephen has been successful in bringing Trevor Johnson, the CEO of JNAP, to his advisory board, and is in discussions with the founder of Bumble and Bumble as well. This indicates to us that Stephen has the vision, passion, and skills needed to make Salon Monster a Canadian tech sector success story. And to Stephen, as my fellow angel investor, Grace Pontes said, you definitely have the qualities of a wildly successful entrepreneur. We wish you all the best and believe that the $225,000 investment in your business would be money well invested. Good luck. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. As someone who has a family member that owns a chair rental salon, I have already sent Salon Monster over. So thank you very much for that. That was great. All right. Well, another round of applause for all of the finalists who have presented today. Thank you very much for sharing your business. Now comes the time where the investors are going to start deliberating all of the presentations and the businesses that we saw today. So. They're going to decide who's going to get the $225,000 investment. And the rest of us will have a quick break. The time now, it's almost 6.30. We're going to be back at 6.40. We're at 6.45. We're going to be back at 6.45. We are very excited for the panel that's going to be happening. You're going to learn, it, learn from different founders who have been wildly successful. They've gone through mergers and acquisitions all right here in the Okanagan. But before I let you go, you're going to see the People's Choice Award, and it's your chance to vote, okay? We want everyone here to vote. What was your favorite? 
What presentation do you think uh, has the founder that you believe is going to be wildly successful? Maybe you think all of them are. Which one out of all of them are going to be wildly successful? So how, you can head to slido.com and type Okanagan Angel Summit or scan the QR code on your name tag. It is also there. Voting is going to close at 645 sharp. So without further ado, stretch your legs, go meet somebody new, grab some food, grab a drink, and we'll see you in approximately 20 minutes.
Okay, we are going to get started again. Welcome back. I hope you were able to meet somebody new, grab a drink, have some food. I know I did. Great, um, great drinks. So thanks so much again to the sponsors for uh, supporting this event tonight. While our investors deliberate to determine who will receive the investment tonight, we will hear from a panel of local founders, all of whom have gone through an acquisition. I'm very excited. I know a few of these founders personally, and I can only say great things. <laughs> In fact, one of them is my neighbor, yes. <laughs> and I would like to introduce tonight's moderator, Claudio Rojas. Claudio is a seasoned business leader with 16 years of professional experience as CEO of the National Angel Capital Organization, or NACO. Some of you are probably very familiar with NACO and the work that they do. He represents 4,200 angel investors that have invested $1.38 billion into 2,000 entrepreneurial companies. Over to you, Claudio. Thank you. I'll try to live up to that bio. So I'm really excited to be here. My family's been in Kelowna for almost 30 years, so my heart's here. I love what I'm seeing, the amazing leadership from Bree, uh, Twi, and the team at Accelerate Okanagan. I, maybe we can give a, a bit of a shout out to them. <laughs> and then as we're hanging out here, I was also an investor um, as part of this process, but I'm letting them do the heavy lifting right now. And so, I can give you a bit of insight into the investors. You know, they really are, their hearts are in it. They want to support the entrepreneurs here. They want to help build world-class companies here in, in, in the Okanagan. Uh, and so uh, uh, it, just phenomenal, phenomenal work by, by bringing the team and, and tweeting the team. So to the investors, regardless of their selections and regardless of whether you agree with their selections or not, I would love to give them a round of applause for the great work that they've done. So, in the current environment, um, I, I can't think of a better topic than this. And I have, I've never moderated a topic on this. You don't hear about this topic in the innovation economy. This is more like a public market type thing. But what I like about it is that it will help situate the founders in the room. It'll give you a vantage point so you can kind of work backwards. Uh, and uh, there's tremendous experience here. There's some really great stories. So maybe with our esteemed panel, we could start with you, Anne-Marie, and then just you know, very quick 30-second bio. Sure. My name is Anne-Marie Kirby, and I started a software company here in Kelowna 19 years ago. Um, I sold it last August 2021, um, and I'm finished working with the, the, the acquirer. And I just want to mention, I have a cold. I have a cold. It's not COVID, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm Josh Fraser. Mostly everyone in the room knows me from Data Nerds. But we founded the company called Estated, and we were acquired last year in August by Adam Data Solutions in California, and now we all work there. I'm Corey Wagner. I um, am the managing director of Staffbase, which is the company that acquired us for North America, as well as the uh, head of email uh, unit. And we started Benantag, I think, back in 2011 and sold it to Staffbase in 2021, May. I'm Christopher Preeb. I'm the founder of Two Hat Security. We, we started that in 2012, sold it to Microsoft in 2021, uh, in the fall there. And now I work for Microsoft, which is a good day with all this open AI stuff and AI. <laughs> I get to play. Awesome. So we're going to keep this lively, and we're going to go where the conversation goes. Uh, but I did want to kick things off around the acquisition pro process, which is you know, the dominant theme here. And uh, Anne-Marie, you, you went through a process, and you had a champion helping you through that. So can you just help situate us? What does that look like when you're thinking about an exit? How do you, how do you wrap your head around it? And then what are the steps that you follow to get to a successful exit? OK, well, a bit of background. I am a software developer. And my partner, business partner, he was a CTO, I was the CEO, both um, very technical people, no business background. We ran Core Health, we built it up um, with no investment. So we ran it for 15 years, no, probably 12 years. And I'm kind of like, how are we ever going to get out of this? But so I thought, we're going to need some help. And I hired a corporate financial specialist, AKA an M&A guy, um, out of Vancouver 
to um, help us build up the business and get organized and then eventually take us to market. So his first idea was quite good. He said, maybe you should hire a marketing team. So we did that. Um, I was a little bit different in that I knew what I wanted for a value at the end. And so I said to him, how do we get there? And that's what we did over the next five years. So he gave us a spreadsheet with 300 line items. He said, you need all of these things, and you need your revenue to be here, and here's some ideas how to get there. So we're going to try to mix this up and, and have a dinner table style conversation. So I'm going to try to, to rile things up a little bit. Is that, was that your experience with Microsoft? That kind of a structured process? Well, here as we come to confession, some of us have ADHD and I wasn't listening to the question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you'd go through and I'll figure out what the heck we're talking about. I can, uh, I, I can jump in if you want. Uh, I still don't know what the question uh, was. I'll, I'll okay. say I'll, it in I'll, a way. I'll guess. So yeah, in terms of our, our process and um, how it differed from hers where she used a consultant that looked at the business and then suggested they hire a marketing team and did a whole bunch of other things to get the business to a point. Um, ours was different in the sense that uh, we, we actually didn't do that in the end, but interestingly, we, we did that at the beginning. We actually did hire someone to take a look at the business. And I think it was one of the most valuable things we did. We weren't actually looking to sell at that time, but we wanted to figure out what the market reaction would be to our company if we did go out to sell or if someone came knocking on our door. And so we learned a lot of things uh, about sort of our churn and the different rates and how, how would we looked at and what would be valued or what would count negatively against us. So that was a super useful thing that we did. Um, but in the end, we actually didn't run a process that, that came naturally just uh, through partnership and Okay, I'm with the party now. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, when we founded the company, like I'd watched uh, Lance here sell Club Penguin to Disney, so he's my brother. That was interesting, so I had the advantage of seeing that trajectory and helping with the due diligence on his company. And so when I founded the company, I said, I want to eventually, uh, to be successful, I want to be the largest chat filtering company in the world. But to do that really well, I first of all have to solve the problem. So in the the startup has the ability that you can solve problems without having to worry about all this corporate slowdown. And then once, once it gets really, really solid, then I can sell it and I can scale it to the rest of the world by selling it to a cloud provider. So at the beginning I said in, in nine years I want to sell it for this amount of money to Microsoft, Amazon, or Google. And we got within 10% of all of our goals. We're off by one year and we hit our financial goals. And we hit, so it was actually really impressive. We could go deeper into how really hard it was, but yeah, it, we did pull it off. And then Josh, as you think about what you went through, any challenges that stood out? Like, how, how was there a tipping point where things could have gone in the opposite direction? For sure, like we were forced into selling. We had uh, data vendor contracts that increased our costs so much in 2022 that our biggest competitor was pretty ripe to already acquire us. And they had told us once we hit a certain revenue milestone, and we've been talking for a few years ahead of time, so we didn't have to do a process because I already knew the exact company that was mm. going to buy us. And with our backs kind of up against the wall, we just had to get it done as soon as possible. So we started in May last year and closed August 4th. But it was a very strategic acquisition. It was our number one competitor. They knew exactly who we were. And I had been talking to the CEO since I founded the company about selling it to him. So it was pretty straightforward, and I still have a good relationship with him. So. A little bit different than this. There was no formal process. So I'll put it out to any of you. You know, one point of you could say controversy in the ecosystem that that's been discussed over the last five years or so, if not longer, is the question of do Canadian companies exit too soon? Is there an early exit phenomenon? Generally, not in your particular case, <laughs> but generally in Canada. So I'll start with that. Yeah, that that was planned just to make sure that everyone's lively. I mean, I set my ambitions that? really, really high, like astronomically high, didn't get close to any of them, um, but had an opportunity in the market. So I would say with, the, with my back up against the wall, selling was kind of like the best option at the time. And so I look at it today, nine months later, and it seems like it was a little bit premature, but I didn't feel like I had another option. So it felt like the right thing to do. And we were acquired by a US company. Right. So Canadians selling to US, it was a little bit of a challenge for sure. We were technically acquired by a Canadian company because Microsoft Canada bought us, but 
really it's an American company. But the internet is, in, is global, um, that it's still, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about the Canadian versus US dynamic of that. Our, our, we, what we did want, so one of our goals was we wanted to keep the team here in Canada. I think that's more important than keeping the company in Canada. And so we were able to keep all of our staff uh, right here in, in, in Kelowna, well, 25, by the time we were done, we, because of COVID, we were so remote. We were 25% in Kelowna and the rest of it was remote. But all, mostly all Canadian, except for two. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think it depends, you know, sell too early in terms of like, could you have got more money for it? Like there might be other reasons to sell earlier that aren't all money related. Um, Canada, especially the West Coast, is probably great for love and lifestyle, and um, that might play into it. But I, I think on the on the whole, like, yes, um, I know when I started the company, my my goals were not as high as a lot of people in the states, just because I think coming from here from a smaller town, ten million dollars was huge. Yeah, like, it's your exposure yeah. and your network. And so I think I think that probably definitely plays into that, where um, you know some down in San Francisco, like a billion bucks, or don't even bother having an idea. It, it just creates a different mentality and I think different goals that you shoot for as well. One of, so at NACO, our focal point is mobilizing capital for Canada's entrepreneurs. And from our perspective, the, even if you're a world-class founder, there tend to be a number of barriers uh, to, to building your company and, and ending up first in market. And so generally, it takes way too long to raise capital. You have to become a professional fundraiser in Canada relative to your counterparts, let's say in Silicon Valley. And then in terms of choice, you don't necessarily have the wide variety of choices to pick the investors that you want that suit your, your business, your personality, your, your needs. And, um, and, then, and so you could kind of package that and just say that the frictions of raising capital are very, very high in Canada. Mm -hmm. And one perspective is that uh, looking at it from that ecosystem perspective, if you're spending all your time learning how to raise capital and raising capital and chasing after investors and your competitor is building a similar company in the valley and they can raise the same amount or even you know, greater levels of capital over a weekend, then who's going to end up first in market and who's going to be third or fourth in market? And, and some are of the view that if you end up third or fourth in market, there's a point that it makes sense to be acquired and then maybe go back at it in your next venture with with much more capital and, and you know, de-risking. Any thoughts on that? Dim. <laughs> That's kind of sad to think about just because of the location of where you found a company, your opportunity is that much better. But at the end of the day, if someone has a great idea and you're gonna build it out, it should work out. Not if you're that passionate about it, right? But yeah, if you have the exact same idea as someone in San Francisco, more than likely you're getting crushed. Okay. So I, I disagree. A, I'll I just disagree. put a positive like, spit on that in the sense that I think it's blue ocean. So it might be yeah. historically, yeah, it's a little bit challenging, but there's also an opportunity. I didn't have that challenge. So I went down to Silicon Valley and I tried to raise money there. I didn't get, no, actually one of my investors was from, from Silicon Valley. I didn't necessarily get not selected because of, not from being from Canada. I wasn't discriminated against for that in that sense. In fact, it seemed like there was a swing where they were thinking beyond the valley, and there was more oppor opportunity. Now, there was a completely different mindset. So the Silicon Valley mounting was, like you said, if, you don't, if you're not going to be a unicorn, a billion dollar company, don't even talk to me. Um, if you're not going to work 100 hours a week, like, you're dead to me. Like, there was like, if you're not going to go and sell 90% of your company to me and, uh, you know, raise $50 million or whatever, you're, so there was a whole different mentality in Silicon Valley, but I didn't find that because I'm in Canada, I'm geographically, I found actually that people were sick of paying the high rates in Silicon Valley and they were starting to look outside the valley. But that's only my experience. Like you may have got something different, but. Um. Yeah, not a ton of experience. We raised from US investors from uh, Boulder, Colorado. And they were like a tier one VC. I can't think of too many tier one VCs though, like the Sequoias and the benchmarks that exist in Canada. Like just that comparison of scale is so dramatically different, you know? They have so many so many resources compared to if you're going to raise in a bunch of angels um, or in to Canada's VC. The Canadian deals are definitely smaller. Yeah. Yeah. But it shouldn't just be a money challenge either. Like if you're solving a good problem, you should be like, yeah. And oh, it doesn't matter who your competition is. You have to have a good business, otherwise yeah. money doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> you can burn a lot of money. <laughs>
Yeah, it's, it's easy to spend money. Given your experience, we'll focus on VCs, then maybe we can talk about angels. Your experience with American VCs and the mindset versus Canadian VCs, without calling out any of my colleagues on the Canadian <laughs> side. <laughs> well, I think I highlight some of the Silicon Valley attributes. It's different because there's actually there's different kinds of investors. And so uh, we've started looking not so much at your Sequoias and those guys that are doing the billion dollars and whatnot. We started looking at some of the growth investors, some of the private equity. Some of it got a little bit scary. Like some of them were like basically their whole plan is to do a roll up. So we're going to take you and fire all your leadership and then put you all together. And so you got to really watch out for some of them. And some of them are very, because we're a very missional company. We wanted to stop bullying on the entire internet. We want to stop abuse on the internet. So we found some really good companies that were missional and spending the time to make sure you're aligned. Actually, that's probably the most important part off topic, but get to know your investors early, like build that relationship two years before you need the money. So like you're on seed round now, start talking to your series A guys, get that relationship because you're going to be stuck with those guys for a long time and they'll have a lot of power over your company. And so you better like them and be able to work with them. So spend like the whole two years. And then it's really easy to raise money because you've got mm -hmm. 30 relationships on the go. Our investors told us when they sat us down for dinner, Evan and I in Boulder, they were like, we, the average marriage in the US was like seven and a half years and like the average length they invested in the company was nine. And they're like, we basically, this has to be better than our marriages, so we really have to like you guys. And I like kind of thought about that in my head. I was like, oh damn, that's how long I'm gonna be dealing with you. It only turned into like a five year time horizon, but. Um, you have to think that, yeah, you have to build a really good relationship with them and trust them. At the end of the day, they're going to guide you through the toughest times of your company. Your investors will be key in that part. Hmm. The distinction between angel and VC. So I'll, I'll give you my hypothesis. And then, so angels are everywhere. They're, they're not necessarily clustered in any, any particular uh, city. Um, they tend to have a founder orientation. And, um, and then, of course, just inherently, it's patient capital. Um, in the sense that they don't have that same time horizon that venture capital funds do. And, and many entrepreneurs early on don't know that you know, VC funds, you want to raise from them when they're early in their cycle. If they're late in their cycle, then, then you know, that can create some challenges. So in thinking about angel, either the angel investor community that we have, or maybe the angel, the angel investor community that we need to have as we think about the future. Uh, Corey, I'm looking at you because you're, you're going down that path as an investor and then maybe some other commentary. Um, yeah, interesting. So we, we didn't go the VC route. We raised a small angel round here in Kelowna from some local investors who had an exit. Um, so not a lot of experience on the VC side other than my new life where, where I get to interact a little bit more on that side. I mean, for us back in the day, it was definitely um, you know trying to raise money and figuring that out was a learning process. I think it was really early. We didn't know how to do it. Um, we were just kind of reaching out and would see what happened. So I, I haven't been super involved, to be honest, since you know uh, since then to see how things have evolved. But I know they definitely have, and there's a lot of great people looking to put money in company uh, money in companies these days here. Um, so I think I, I mean I think it definitely has evolved. I think there's probably always ways it can get better. And I think honestly, one of the really interesting things for me as I look at the panel and look at <laughs> some of the things here, you know, started with Club Penguin. And then now you have this like also next generation of people and then the next generation you get more more people who are interested i think investing locally in businesses but also great talent coming from those companies that make those businesses even more investable so um yeah let's do it okay it's been addressed thanks cool <laughs> thank you um, angels, where are we? Where do we go with the angel communities? We think about it from either a national perspective or even from within Kelowna, given your experiences. I don't have any experience. <laughs> I think you also have to be cautious with angels because there's not in a definition of a single definition of an angel. Like yours was, was good. Your, your better angels are going to be the ones that um, I believe in your product. I believe in you as an entrepreneur. I am not going to go and phone you every day and say, where's my money, where's my money, where's my money? But they're going to, like, they're almost like in how I'm approaching my angel investments. I'm almost looking at it closer to charity. Um, not quite, but it's like, 
He means that in the nicest way. <laughs> I'm going to give this person money, and it's a charity that potentially I could get a large return on. If I do enough of them, I could probably be OK. But it's more of like, I believe in you. And because I believe in you, I'm going to put money on you. Um, and uh, then hopefully it's going to work out. But then I, then I have to deal with the metrics of like, is it actually going to make money and whatever else. But so you have to make good bets. But those are the kind of the better angels. But you got to watch out for some of the ones that are um, like that money is so precious to them, they're going to call you every day and worry about it and get over involved and start micromanaging your, like, it can get bad, I assume. I never, I screened all of them out, so I didn't have anyone. So I'm imagining they're out there. Maybe it's just a fake fear, but. <laughs> I've heard some stories. You have? I've heard a couple times. I, I mean, I, sure. I, I think, t you know, to your other comment, I think if you care about it that much that you feel the need to call the entrepreneur every single day asking where your money is, like you probably shouldn't be angel investing or you shouldn't have invested in that company. Yeah. yeah and for the angel investors in the room, I mean, you got to really, like, <laughs> don't invest. Like, this is not the horse races or anything. Like, you got to, like, you got to be OK it's not with like it. The horse races. Well, really. Odds? <laughs> One in 10? Not far. OK. No, well, you just got to be okay with putting the money in, money in, and then be at peace with it, and let it like let it give it time to nurture, and just be supportive of your invest, like be be their champion, be their encourager. Um, and I'm saying a lot of this stuff aspirationally because I don't have a whole lot of experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we're going to move to questions soon. So think about your questions. It would be great to hear your insights, your commentary, or or if you want to drill down on any particular issue. Um, but while you're thinking about your questions, and there will be some microphones circulating soon, as, as founders, and I get that you know, we're Canadian, so there, there tends to be a humility, but what would you say was your superpower building the company? And, and you, know, you joked a little bit, Chris, about um, you know, ADHD. Is that a superpower, generally, yeah. for entrepreneurs? I would think that it is. So people say it's a disability, but really it's a personality type. You yeah. know, and just teachers don't know how to handle them. So, <laughs> Uh, so with, with that, I, with ADHD and, and stuff like that, I can really, really focus, which is, sounds opposite, but I can get hyper-focused for like eight hours, zone in on a task, get completely lost in my work. Of course, that's when my back is screwed. Um, so <laughs> it has a side effect to it. Um, and I can see things. So I, I can imagine like all the code working inside my head, and I can move it around and manipulate it, even like artificial intelligence. I can see the data flowing. And I can adjust it, and I can predict how it's going to impact the models. And so I can do stuff that's unique. But I have to also surround myself by incredible people that are good at finance, because I fall apart on the, the remembering to do something. So and then like the administration, and then the sales, like all like I, I got to figure out what my weaknesses are, and surround myself on those points because I might be able to shine at some things, but that's at a cost of some other things. And there's some people here that I noticed. Um, I noticed Karen and Michelle were here, who really really helped me. Um, on those areas and covered a lot of my gaps that I had in the early days. Any other superpowers? Um, and I would position that in the sense that what can sometimes be viewed as a disadvantage, leveraged right can be an extraordinary advantage. That's what I hear with how you've, yeah, you've captured sure. that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think for, for us, um, the thing that I'm probably good at is not being the best at everything and realizing that. So we built an amazing team. Some of those people might be in the audience. Um, but we had some really great people. And I think just empowering those people to go and actually run with things and have that ownership um, and getting out of the way is, is hopefully something that I did well. You scaled your sales organization fast, too, and like successfully after, I think, a few attempts. <laughs> I mean, your name was on the door. Does it count? <laughs> I mean, I'd say just like never giving up. Like I started in 2013 and just kept hammering at it. We had you know product after product, idea after idea, failure after failure. And you just as a founder, to, you have to keep going to get to an acquisition eventually. So I would say it's just like can't give up. If you know that you like see the outcome, like if you see what it's going to turn into, you just have to keep going because there's no matter what, if you run a company for seven to 10 years, you're going to have like crazy highs and crazy lows and you need to be able to like manage that. And if you quit <laughs> during that, it's just like, it'll, it'll never work out. You won't be successful. Now, what about the founders that should quit for what, whatever reason they're not, <laughs> they, they, right? 
And then I'll jump to you, yeah, okay. Emery. That's a fantastic question. Um, that's sometimes the hardest pill to swallow. The hardest thing I've, I've heard, I don't know if this might be offside, but like throw the baby out with the bathwater. I've had to tell some people it before. Um, it's a hard thing to swallow, but it depends on where your company's at and where you might actually get to. Some people's ideas actually just aren't good, but they're so passionate about them. So you gotta like flip an angle. But yeah, there are definitely times you have to quit. So have good advisors, have good mentors, talk to angels, talk to your community. Like, you know, I think about the times that Corey and Jason and Founder Fridays and we used to all have parties and stuff together. So many people in this room probably remember those days in like 2014 to 16, but we all connected with each other and like helped push through those tough times. So have a few people that you can rely on that will help you get through them and will tell you if what you're doing is dumb and to shut it down because sometimes you do have to kill ideas, 100%. Superpower, Emery. Well, I was going to agree with that. I just say I'm too stupid to give up. Like years. I didn't know. People told me over and over, "What are you doing?" And I just didn't listen. But determination, right? And looking at different angles of something doesn't work. But I'd actually say my superpower is um, relating to other people and to listening to them. So whether it's customers, employees, and actually just caring about people, because that just comes back. And so. That I think that's what I built my company on. It wasn't brilliance or anything like that, but it was relying on people and them feeling they should step up, and they did. Interesting. So we're going to shift to questions. So I'm hoping to see some hands up soon. Um, so this frustrates me as someone that that you know, like I said, you know, my heart's in Kelowna. I love BC. Um, I can see what's happening here and, and what's, what's here in the room, the vibe in the room. You might not appreciate it, but I do. I, I've seen all the different ecosystems. And I'll, I'll say this very lightly, but the big cities in Canada don't have a monopoly on great founders. And, and then I'd, I'd also situate this in the sense that we're, we're this massive geography. And yet we still, in the innovation economy, we still play small town hockey style politics. The, the regional kind of rivalries, my family does not, my family here does not, my cousins, you know, they don't like Toronto, and, and you know, the Maple Leafs are enemy number one, as many of you can appreciate, and that's fine when it comes to things like hockey, but in the innovation economy, this is a global race, this is a global competition, and when you have a country as massive as we are, and yet you have the population that's less than the size of California, we have significant advantages, but we also have that geographic disadvantage, especially if we bring small town politics to this global competition. Um, so with that in mind, how do we create the conditions in Kelowna or in the Okanagan so that if you are a founder building the next big thing, you have everything that you need here. You can tap into all the other markets, uh, especially in you know, the large destination markets like the United States. But how do we create the conditions so that the Stuart Butterfield Founder of Slack, 1.5 million, built a $27 billion company. Uh, America takes credit for that, but it, it was homegrown here in BC. How do, we, how do we create the conditions for that to happen here, for the Stuart Butterfields, the uh, Jane Butterfields of the future to build their companies here? This is a paid advertisement for Accelerate Okanagan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got you, Brady. It's pretty incredible when it was done. I mean, I got here in 2013. It was the first thing I heard about. First place I went, went through all the programs, sat on the board for a little bit, saw, you know, so many, made so many friends throughout the years because of it. So the community is what really builds it, in my opinion. Yeah, I think like Kelowna or BC. We can go a little bit broader. We can go either Okanagan or, you know, where's yeah. your heart in terms of building? building an ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of really good things. I mean, I, I obviously like the ecosystem because we built a, a cool company here. And I think, I think there were some real, real advantages to being here, um, AO being one. But even just in Kelowna and being a small hub, some things, um, you know, some things that were struggles and I think still will be in Kelowna if you require people to be in office is access to talent of people who've kind of been there and, and done that, especially when you're in that scaling startup phase where if you go for someone way too senior, they're probably not going to know what to do and you kind of need that sweet spot of seen it before, done it, and you know how to take a company from you know small to mid. Um, that was something that I think we 
we were starting to add as we went along, but I, I noticed is usually missing there. So, uh, but again, these days now with it stuff being more remote, you can you can access people that you couldn't before. So, I I actually really like the area. I wouldn't move to San Francisco and start my next company. I'd I'd do it here. So. You look like you're deep in thought. Because, yeah, we went 100% remote. So we started going remote, then COVID pushed us the rest of the way. So we ended up 100% remote. Then we finally reopened the office, but it's all like you just bring your computer that day and you rent a desk. That was like a few months ago we finally. You made your employees rent desks? <laughs> 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 on a little sign out sheet. You know, like you just sign on the desk. For, I haven't tried it yet. I've not been to the so office yet. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't even have my ID card from Microsoft to go into the office. But. <laughs> so I have a laptop now. Though. <laughs> no, back to topic. So yeah, I mean, Kelowna is fantastic because it's this little town that could. Because we had like some startups like Club Penguin grew. Then they brought Disney here. And then people had all this talent and then they went all over the town and then they started a bunch of other mobile game studios and game studios and customer support things and we had all these startups that came out of it, including mine. You and I started about the same time. There was like five or six of us in that cohort and then it was like ripples <laughs> and each time we did this ripple and then we'd grow and something would happen to that company and those people would end up going somewhere and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and so there's an energy that's happening that just keeps getting bigger and bigger um, in this town and, and we're unique from other places that happen because we've got kind of a different niche. So unlike Vancouver, which has got like 500 people doing hairstyles on a video game, we have like very specific people that are doing, making very good mobile games or making very good experiences or, or doing animations over at Yeti or doing uh, like these smaller things and kids safety, uh, mobile games, small, like really cool stuff that they're not even trying out of Vancouver or not doing it the way we're doing it. I think we've got a good chance of success in this town. I think there's a good energy and a good good vibe happening. Yep. Yeah. One, one of the interesting things someone asked me, I think AO did a trip down to Boulder, Colorado, and they really liked the sort of tech ecosystem there. And the question was, like, how do we how do we speed that up in Kelowna, and how do we bring that here but do it faster? And something I had spent some time thinking about, and then over time I, I realized or I think I realized, at least my thinking, is that it takes these companies like Club Penguin and then the next round and the next round to actually develop a lot of that talent. And like now, from a lot of the companies here, you have people who've seen a lot of stuff, who have so much experience in SaaS and all the different things. And that, that didn't exist 10 years ago. And every company has their own specialty. We built out a big sales team. So there's a bunch of great sales people here who've sold a lot of SaaS that that wasn't a, really a thing for us when we were starting. So. I think it naturally happens over time, and, and there is a lot of great talent here. Awesome. So I'm looking for questions, and if I don't get any, I'll call some people out. And Bree, I'm looking at you, and Tammy, I'm looking at you, but I think this gentleman may have saved the day. First of all, congratulations, and thank you guys for uh, hosting the panel and, and being up there. Uh, we all like to talk millions and billions, but um, I want to be the one to ask the difficult question of one panelist. And uh, by the numbers, Corey, how many pairs of yellow shoes do you own? <laughs> and how many banana costumes were purchased over the life of the company? Um, shoes with yellow on them or yellow themed, probably like six or seven currently. I go through them pretty fast. Uh, banana suits, I, I think 2,000, 3,000. But <laughs> don't, don't tell the um, eco people in the room because high wastage. <laughs> oh, used once and thrown out. Yeah. <laughs> Sauce awesome. and stuff on them. <laughs> I think it's sauce on your pants. So I think it's uh, a question. Kind of a, a comment and a question. Mike, Mike. <laughs> and maybe name, organization. Yeah, hi. Uh, Saul Katz. I started Solo GI Nutrition. Um, and we launched in the US in 2004 and won an award for the most innovative product of the year in the food industry. But I chose Kelowna and family and balance of life instead of moving to New York or Los Angeles. Canada, as you say, is very difficult to really build a business because we're so spread out. 
risk averse and small population. But if you have a good idea in the States, you could do very well very quickly. So I think part of it is, you know, priorities, right? And you sold your companies early because that money gives you a great lifestyle and you value maybe things differently than just chasing the buck in the US. So, you know, I think that's a challenge and a priority and an opportunity if you're here maybe it kind of sets your perspective on really what you want to achieve. So I guess I kind of make a comment, but open it up for other comments. I, I don't think I can be accused of uh, selling mine early. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm calling out Tammy because uh, Pacific Can has done extraordinary work, so Western economic um, diversification in bringing us all together and supporting the amazing work of Brie and Accelerate Okanagan. So thank you for that, Tammy, and to your team. So, and you might not all know this, but there's a new office here in Kelowna, so it speaks to the commitment to helping the Okanagan really you know, go to the next level. Um, but I'm putting you on the spot in terms of any burning questions that you might have. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that. Now I feel like I have to have a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good question, but I'm, I'm curious about this. You all talked a little bit about um, your experience and you all had a sort of a different story, but I'm curious about whether there was anything that really surprised you when you went through the process of, of, of um, being acquired. I was really surprised by the amount of things that need to come together to have something actually go through. So we'd had interest and conversations with some other companies as well, as well and went through huge long processes. Um, and, and even just in kind of our initial fact finding what it looks like, but something as small as like, something that you might think on your end is like a great fit for them. There can be the smallest thing on their side where it doesn't fit their current strategy or just, Everything needs to come together perfectly to get that deal done, in, in my experience at least. And when I started, I didn't know it was going to be that hard. It was like, get to 10 mil, and then people will be a knocking. And people knocked, but had to tick every single box to make it the right fit, not have layoffs during COVID, like selling to big enough accounts, were the people, like just so many different things there. So that was surprising to me. What about the amount of money in your bank account after the acquisition? And, and I'm, I'm kind of joking, but I'm kind of not in the sense of how did it feel at that human level? Actually, that was one of the most depressing moments of my life. I worked so hard to make money, and when that hit the company bank account, I felt nothing. I went to Mexico and worked at an orphanage like a month ago and felt a million times better than when millions of dollars hit your bank account. So it's like after eight years of grinding as an entrepreneur and you get a punch in the face like that, it was like... Cool, I can pay my investors out. You know, my sale was a wash too. We raised at $15 million and sold at $15 million. So when that happens, your employee stock options are worthless. Um, I didn't know that as a founder. That was, that's my shocking thing. No clue that's how it worked. Um, <laughs> next time I will. But um, it's a really hard lesson to learn. Um, very, very difficult, challenging conversations with all the people I worked with that day. And so I didn't really understand that, but it was like the best option at the time. So yeah, but the money part, you know, being financially free I think is like something that's very nice. Um, but at the end of the day, the money is not, you know, what I had it out in my head to be. I wish I would have known that. I would, I'd tell myself that when I was 25. It's like, whatever you get at the end of the day, it's not gonna make you happy. Like that, that was a huge surprise factor for me. Disagree? <laughs> well, maybe, it, oh. maybe it's my age. I don't know, yeah. but I was pretty damn happy with it. <laughs> I think that's a, a great note to close off on. Any final comments <laughs> before we do? I'd like to say that um, there's been some talk about selling early out of Kelowna. I don't think we sold early. Um, we sold strategically to achieve the goals that we wanted, and based on the changes of like all the stuff that's happened and the revolutions in AI, I mean, we're well, well positioned now uh, to be there. So I, I just wanted to add that comment. I didn't want to leave the impression that, and Kelowna is not, you know, just because we didn't disclose our amounts doesn't mean it was small. 
Um, some of us have done really, really well, and we, we sold just when we wanted to sell exactly. And there's been some amazing deals out of Kelowna, so it's got a good potential. Yeah, I want to leave on a positive note that actually Kelowna is doing really stinking well. Yeah, and, and my closing comment on this is that we're working, so we're a national organization. We're privileged to have Accelerate Okanagan as one of our members and, and many others. We represent all uh, angel groups in Canada, um, and we also represent um, uh, most of the most uh, prominent incubators and accelerators around the country. And what's close to our hearts is making sure that you're tapped into the power of the national network so that if you need a customer, let's say, in, uh, in Halifax, and you need an investor in Toronto, and yet you're building and scaling your team here, uh, what we aspire to is to reduce those frictions to make the country, you could say, smaller uh, as it pertains to your business, so that you can, you can build fast with national scale and then, and then leap into global markets where you know, we're, we're not a big destination market, so you will need access to other markets. I have been spending some time in the United States. There are three million expat Canadians around the world that have done some extraordinary things. I had the privilege of, of spending time on Thursday night at Canada House in Los Angeles. Canada has a house in Los Angeles. It's the residence of the um, Consul General of Los Angeles. And it was a pre-Oscar event, celebrating with people that we were rooting for, like Sarah Pauly and Brendan Fraser, can proud Canadians that would go on to win the Oscars on Sunday night. So there's this powerful global network. We have this diaspora around the world that we haven't fully tapped into. Um, and, and so it's a privilege to start thinking down that path and, um, and my aspiration is that as we move into the future, not only will you be able to leverage national scale as you build your company from the Okanagan, but you'll also be able to leverage the global scale that we have as a country uh, with all of our, our global interconnections. So thank you so much to all of you, Anne-Marie, Josh, Corey, Chris, three in the team, thank you so much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Thank you to everyone that presented. Thank you, Claudio. I can say that we started our business in Ontario. So some of our investors are from NACO. So those that were involved in Ottawa and Toronto. But we decided to move out to BC because we wanted a different lifestyle. We wanted to build our company right here in BC because it's so important. There's so much to offer here. So it was, you know, through NACO that we were able to allow us to do that. So that's great. And I will say, I, back in I think 2014, I worked for Banana Tag. I still may or may not have my banana suit, and I may or may not uh, have ran the Sun Run in my banana suit while working at Banana Tag. So yes. The banana costumes are real, yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much uh, to everyone uh, that presented today. It was a fantastic panel. And uh, now we have the moment that you have all been waiting for. It is about to happen. The investors have been mulling over. They've had really deep discussions. They've had some maybe even arguments trying to determine who is going to walk out with the $225,000 investment. So please head to the atrium. And when the investors are ready, over the next little bit, uh, we are going to make the announcement. It's going to happen from the landing on this staircase. So if you just walk around here, if you are in the viewing area, you can kind of like circle around the second floor. Um, and then the top six finalists, if you can head up to the stairs, and we're going to get ready for some of the big announcement to happen. Thank you. <laughs>
When, oh, Alex, it's still going to be about 10 minutes. Okay. Steven, if you have to, yeah. Hello, hello, hello. All right, so we are about, sorry if I'm very loud, I do have a loud voice. Hello, is that better? Is that a little better? Okay. Um, it's still going to be around 10 minutes, okay? So the investors, they need a little bit more time. So there are some drinks, there's some food. Please help yourself, meet someone new, and we will make the big announcement shortly. Fighting over you.
Can all the finalists come on up? Jason, I see you. Come on up. If you're in the top six, you should be up here on the stairs. All right, folks, this is the time that we have been waiting for. Make sure that you can see the fantastic companies right here. They are all on the stairs. Woo woo, can we give them all a round of applause? That's a good idea, yeah. All right, I would like to call up the Apex sponsor of the Okanagan Angel Summit to announce the People's Choice Award. Please welcome Mike McCauley from Lawson Lindell. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I just would really like to congratulate all of the finalists here tonight uh, and, and just say what a great job those pitches. Um, can I get one more round of applause for the pitches tonight and all the finalists? So we're here to present the People's Choice Award tonight, uh, and I just wanted to say this is our fifth year sponsoring the Okanagan Angel Summit. Uh, we were a founding sponsor. Uh, we've been involved with the summit from the very beginning, and when we were first putting the summit together, it was you know really with a hope and a dream of really uniting the angel community in the Okanagan, growing the capital network in this region, and helping to support our entrepreneurs and. It is so incredible to see what the momentum is that we built since year one and where this is tonight, five years later, and it's so incredibly back in person uh, and feel the energy from the crowd and the entrepreneurs and everyone that's here tonight. Um, so just really, really happy to be sponsoring this again. Uh, so in terms of the People's Choice Award, the prize includes generous donations from our other Angel Summit sponsors, the Central Okanagan Economic Development Commission, M&P, Stand Up Ventures, and Lawson Landell. Uh, there's some swag, there's some in-kind services, I believe. There's a donation in the winner's name to a charity of their choosing. So without further ado, I will announce the People's Choice winner. Local, local favorite, Tunnet. Hello. Oh, wow. Well, uh, first, I want to uh, thank the amazing community we have here uh, to support the Okanagan Tech uh, startups, uh, especially Tunnet. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for uh, Accelerate Okanagan, some of the mentors, investors. Um, thank you uh, for the prize. Mike, this is the first time you handed me something and it not being a check. He's a great lawyer, though. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, thank you guys, and uh, I'll enjoy this. All right. Congratulations again, Jason. All right, now it's uh, the moment we've all been waiting for. And uh, so again, congratulations to all of you. I know it's been a journey, and this is the moment. So you're probably like, hurry up, Twee. Um, so I'm honored on behalf of all the investors to announce tonight's investment of the $225,000. The investment goes to Smart One Technologies.
Wow. Um, you know, being here uh, five years ago um, for some of the training sessions and meeting all the wonderful people and community along the way, uh, that's who's invested in us, whether that was their time, attention, or dollars. And this ecosystem is, is so amazing to, to have for the boots on the ground, for whether you're on the investment side or the technology side or the education side. Um, we wouldn't be here with all, all of your belief and having Margaret in the crowd who's been with us for you know as five years now. Those connections are, are what stand you know every day. Our employees envision and embody every value that is in this room. So thank you so much to my wife and my family at home. I'm on the road a lot more now, so. <laughs> but we're gonna make you proud. So thank you so much for your belief. All right, so that's a wrap for our fifth Okanagan Angel Summit. So have a great night, everyone, and we'll see you at the two, the sixth Okanagan, six, yes, oh my goodness, we're on to our sixth year. The sixth Okanagan Angel Summit. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight.